So I'm going to talk about the dynamic model for the analog meter. And I'm starting off with the, uh, the end result that we're going to get, which is this transfer function here. And I expect that from a dynamic systems course, you're familiar with this form of model. It, a transfer function is a property of a system. It's the ratio of, of, of the output or of the system over the input. So you know, you should start where you can think in this case of, of a system as, you know, lock with input and output. And the output here, right, is our data and inputs the voltage. And so this function represents uh, this, um, this system here. And we'll be using this block description as we go through here. And you should recognize also, you should be familiar with the um, this form where you have, whenever you see this, the S terms, right, the Laplace terms are the dynamic terms. So if, if we got rid of the dynamic terms, right, we'd get rid of these two here. And you'd end up with, with essentially the model we started with in the first part, which is a static gain, right? There's just this constant, right? So I'm going to go through and show you the derivation of the, this dynamic system model. You should also, uh, or will become hopefully comfortable with seeing that whenever you see a model like this, the highest order polynomial, right, is the order of your system. So this is a second order system model. I'm going to derive for you a couple of different models uh, and motivate why, why I want to use this transfer function model and also um, uh, why it becomes second order. The nice thing about it is that, that from the static experiments that we've already run that you're familiar with, that gives you one of these parameters right and then we only need two others and you should hopefully also be familiar from a systems class uh, and we've talked about the damping ratio and the natural frequency so you you should this should look familiar to you and um, the state space model and that I'll show you and, and um, the other thing I'm, I'm I'm assuming that you're familiar with state space models and how they're derived from bond graphs too and so I'm going to show you a couple of bond graphs uh, for this meter, and um, you're going to show you that the state space model, at least the highest order one, needs five parameters. So we can reduce it so that we only need three. We already know how to find one, so then we only have to find two more parameters, and we've got a nice experimental model, experimentally based model. Um, so again, in summary, the, the transfer function model only needs these two parameters, and that's kind of what we're, we're shooting for in the lab. So um, again, I'm going to show you the full model, and then how we can neglect the inductance in the coil of the meter and then that becomes a nice second order model. I also want to show you where um, how the electromechanical torque is modeled. So just go cool. continue with that. You saw these schematics uh, in, in the first part. Um, the rotational part of that meter, it's a nice rotational system. A nice system to study is it just um, exhibits uh, the uh, fixed axis rotational dynamics that you study quite a bit. And on the electrical side, a simple electrical circuit, the inductance is not shown here, right? But you should think of inductance as being in the same series circuit in here. And in the, in the, this is the, the meter resistance, so you know, there's also some inductance in here. The meter movement here is, a, is that is, a, is really there's a torque here that's induced by the current flowing through here. I've included this other picture just to show you how in this particular meter, that moving coil is attached to the needle. And that's the needle that we're trying to position, right? And uh, these, the way these little, um, uh, and there's a permanent magnet in here. So there's always a gap here with with flux that goes nice and radially through these uh, through these uh, uh, coils. So you you uh, unlike other meters that are that the torque is dependent on position. I know that's getting to be a little bit too much detail, but the nice thing of it is is that the, that, that magnetic field is always um, perpendicular to the coil, so you you get, uh, as we'll see, a constant um, uh, gyrator modulus. Is what I'm going to show you. So here's how that coil couples into the rest of this. All the moving coil, the the inertia of that coil actually is actually moving with all with with the with the needle as well. And there's the spring. Okay. So a lot of information on this slide. I'm not going to go through all of it, but this just relates to basic physics. Each of those coils, again, moving through this magnetic field. This is the field that we're talking about. That's in, there's a permanent magnet inside that 
that meter, and that in, uh, induces right this force. So the bottom line is is this force here, and so um, this little delta force on this coil in your basic physics is the I cross E, right? And so that's when you break when that breaks that when that breaks down, you see that the the force on the coil is related to a current. If you remember in in your bond graph studies, hopefully, whenever you have that kind of relation, in other words, an effort is related to the flow on the other side uh, of this transduction element, then you you use a, a gyrator for that, and and you can see that the gyrator modulus depends on the the uh, the magnetic field strength, the length, and so on. Um, in this case, this 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 is going to be a constant. It's not going to depend on any alpha term here. Okay, so. Showing you again, you can go back and read the details here. I'm not going to go through. I'm just going to show you the overall bond graph. The left side here shows that circuit model. You have that voltage in, right? And it flows through a coil inductance. This is, a, remember, one junction represents a series circuit. So all of these elements have the same current. That, this is the total resistance. The coil plus the series resistance is all in there too, right? The series is the one that you add. And that gets transduced in, you know, through this gyrator into a torque. Remember, the motion of the needle itself also gets transduced into a back EMF here. Right? So that gyrator models that coupling between these, the rotational and the electrical systems. And on the, on the mechanical side, you have your inertia, total inertia. Remember, that's going to be the moving coil together with the needle. Everything's all together. It's all one, um, we assume it's all one rigid body. Then you've got that coil spring and then there I'm throwing some damping in there because I know this guy there's some damping as that coil moves and there's some wind I mean sorry some windage if you like on the needle it's it's significant enough so it's a it's a nice simple little bond graph and then remember we identify the number of states from the causality on the independent energy storage elements which is this one here uh, this one here and this one here so we've got a third order system the I elements, remember, they have effort in, effort in, and then the C has flow in. So these are three, the three states. Remember, the states are identified as the, on the I elements, the momentum variables on those two, and then the, the displacement variable on the Cs. Okay, so I'm going to assume that you know, and if you know Mongrass, you can go back and look at this. But the bottom line is, for that model, you can derive, you identify the, the three states, angular momentum of the needle, flux linkage and position, and then you can derive these state equations. I'm not going to go through them in detail. And then here are the gyrator relationships. When you put that all together, you get three state equations. And because everything is linear in this model, you can put these in this state space form, right, which is in this matrix form. Okay. So note how many uh, unknown parameters we've got. I mean, the resistances are easy, but we don't know the inductance, uh, the, that resistance there. Sorry about that. The J, we don't know that. This damping, so there's a lot of parameters here, the stiffness that we would need to know in order to model the system. So I think it's one, two, three, four, five, right? Uh, recount that one's six, but we can measure that so we know that. So there's really five unknown parameters. And um, so this is the state space model for the third order system. Now, this had includes the inductance, but actually, it turns out that. You know, looking at that response experimentally, it, it, you know, we can say, hey, that looks pretty second order. And it turns out, really, that for this system, the inductance is so small that, for all intents and purposes, when you put a voltage in here, that current gets uh, up to steady values so quickly because this inductance is so small. So I'm kind of shading it out here. When you do that, that state goes away. And so now we have just one, two states. Right, these two elements rep de uh, determine that we have two states, just these two mechanical states. The current now is determined by the resistance here, and that has some uh, that that's in intuitive, right? The series resistance is what we're sizing, right, to to size the current through the electrical part, and that determines the torque that we drive against here. Now, these the dynamic effect is. Uh, 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 interacting between these two is what gives us our dynamics as well as with the damping that's uh, the total damping depends on on the mechanical damping as well as the, as the resistance right okay so same process now the current is determined again by voltage drop 
and resistance only, not with any inductive effect, with any flux linkage. You only have two states. Those uh, are your state equations, but uh, when we write them in state space form, they look something like this. Now, we're not going to use them in this form because I want to show you that I want to convert that into a second order ODE. Again, this is all good practice. Um, you can say, okay, uh, I, I want to use theta as my uh, variable of interest in a second order ODE. And I'll show you in a second why that's efficient to do that. Uh, you remember that H is related to J omega N. You can then take the derivative of that, substitute that into your momentum equation, and then um, you, you uh, then from that equation you get a second order equation uh, right in theta. And that's the equation we want to deal with. When we reduce terms here, we divide by J through here, you can see that helps us define our uh, zeta and omega n. And also on the right hand side it defines you know this input term. Okay? And that's important. So here's the equation that we were looking for is that is that uh, second order equation. Okay? I'm going kind of fast but you can go back and look at the slides. Bottom line is that's where that sec final second order equation comes from. And I want to show you that when the dynamics go away, right, that means these two guys go away. Right, the, the 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 derivatives go away. All you have left then is a relationship between theta and v, and you can see these terms go away. And then, basically, what you'd have at the end of the day is that static gain model that that you played with in the first uh, lab. And so you can see that theta, and I'm using S S here to mean the steady state or static model, is just related to this constant times the voltage, and that's exactly what you measured. So you can see that physically that parameter is related to R sub M, which is the gyrator modulus, right? That has those magnetic uh, um, parameters, the size of the coils and so on. It's all embedded in here. The stiffness of the spring and the coil resistance, all of that determines that little parameter that you measured experimentally. Now you can see what that is physically related to. If you check the units on that, you see in fact that it's you know, radians per voltage or I'm, I'm uh, because we measured degrees, uh, we're using degrees, but this is strictly radians per voltage or degrees per voltage, so it's angle over, over voltage. It should be consistent, uh, and you can check that, and it is, right? So the nice thing about the static gain model is it tells us, hey, if I want, man, that's how exactly how we use it for our open loop test, right? We said if you want a certain angle, you, you just kind of invert this guy, and it'll tell you what voltage you need, right? Uh, note that I changed the subscript here. Here, theta over V, you multiply by V, and you get theta. When I invert it, it's a different, it's V uh, over theta. So this has units of voltage over angle, it just should. So you multiply it by a desired angle. It tells you what voltage to put into the analog meter to go there. That's our static model, and we'll use that. Again, this model, the dynamic model, the static model, all of that works well as long as the parameters are known and they don't change. And, and, and as long as these dynamic effects aren't significant, then that's fine. Of course, we saw that we get some overshoot, so uh, we know that the dynamic effects aren't insignificant. So now, to once you have a second order equation, it's easy to apply uh, a Laplace transform. However, you want to, however you do that, we one way is to actually say that oh, each any time you see a, a double derivative, right? That's an s squared times that theta. So you could just say this is s squared theta. There's an s here, and you can divide through. There's a quick way to convert this into into s domain. Uh, again, I'm assuming that you you have seen that uh, in in your uh, systems class. Once you do that, remember u is uh, is defined as this k, the static gain times the voltage. That's the input, and um, but this is the dynamic model. When I when I do that, I get that. Remember, this is the transfer function we started with. You, you're just uh, dividing by theta over v. Once you have it, this this is an s domain. Remember, this is not in time domain anymore. This is the time domain ODE. The whole advantage of putting it into the s-domain now is that you can use algebraic manipulation and work in the s-domain. As we start talking about this model representations, I'm going to show you how to put this into uh, LabVIEW to do simple simulations in this form. But also when we talk about you know, linear systems, and remember anytime you have a system like this in, in, in s-domain, strictly talking about linear systems. And also uh, these control systems, you, know, you can um, describe systems this way with these linear forms. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, so we're going to be using this in, in, in the control system descriptions as well. Okay. Um, again, I want to emphasize, as I did um, 
before that this model embeds the static gain model. It, it, when you talk about it going to kind of a static uh, relation is when these S terms go to zero, right? And uh, then you can see that theta over V is just K and that's your static or steady state model. So in order for us to have a complete model of the analog meter, you can see it's derived from the basic physics. All we need to do is find right your zeta and omega n and that would be good to go. And uh, we're going to do you're going to do that experimentally in, in, in the lab. Okay.